Hello and welcome to this podcast episode that is bringing together young people from the National Federation of Young Farmers Clubs, SOS UK, Students Organising for Sustainability and FLAME, the youth branch of the Land Workers Alliance. This is part of a collaborative project called How Farming Can Cool the Planet and it's all about bringing young farmers, students and youth food activists all from different backgrounds together to share their experiences and find common ground. What better place to do that than at the Oxford Real Farming Conference 2024. I'm Dan, a young farmer and podcaster from Devon. Myself and four other young people. I am Phoebe. Hi, I'm Visa Walters. So my name's Aruj. Hi, I'm Leo. We are all experiencing this conference for the first time. And throughout this episode, you will get to hear our stories as well as what we learnt at this year's conference. The stories that you will hear won't necessarily be the views of the organisations we're representing, but they will be our own personal experiences and views on the topics being discussed. Hopefully, this episode will give you a real flavour of the many inspiring conversations and debates that were had here at the conference. Here's a taste of what's to come in the episode. Knowing that we could be the age that can turn that sort of biodiversity decline around, you know, looking back in the history books, if we were the age that did that, it'd be amazing. This, I think it's really important that the younger generations are here to have a voice and, and hear what's going on and have their say. And it's such a shame that we don't embody this more and we're not, like as Muslim, as the Muslim community in the UK, we're not more at the forefront of, of sort of ethical farming because it goes hand in hand with our faith. This conference has been just absolutely incredible. Like I'm too inspired. I'm gonna have to take a rest after this. So I've just arrived in what can only be described as a soggy Oxford. I've driven up from the farm in Devon up to Oxford first thing this morning. We're in the first week of January 2024 and there has been a lot of rain. There has been a lot of flooding in this neck of the woods and all over the country really and considering there are going to be a lot of farmers in Oxford this week and farmers love to moan about the weather all this rain is going to be high on the agenda however I've got a feeling that there won't be too much moaning going on over the next couple of days because I've heard that if you want to go to a food and farming event that is super positive and forward thinking then the Oxford Real Farming Conference is the event to go to. But what is the Oxford Real Farming Conference? Looking online, they proudly say that this conference is where farmers, growers, activists, policymakers and researchers from all over the world who are interested in transforming our food system all come together. There's going to be a really diverse group of people at this event and I'm excited because I'm about to head off to the opening session, which is being held at the Oxford Town Hall, which is not just where the conference kicks off, but I'm also going to be meeting the rest of the group for the first time. We are all going to be sharing our stories and experiencing this conference together. So I'm looking forward to getting started. And yeah, let's let's go have a chat to them all and find out more about them. I am Phoebe. I'm originally from Norfolk and I've spent the past year working on an organic farm in South Devon and training at the Apricot Centre. Um, so I'm a new entrant farmer and yeah, I've just kind of entered this world of land work. What made you want to become a new entrant? Um, I was working in consultancy in sustainability and food and agriculture before this year. And I think I just felt a frustration at wanting to be in on the action, doing something really tangible and really practical yeah. and something that felt restorative um, for me personally, as well as for the kind of purpose of why I was at work and what I was trying to do. And this passion for food and farming, where, where do you think that comes from? I care deeply about the climate crisis and um, trying to fix that as much as I can. But I think along the way, I've realized how much we need to be restored as like communities and as humans and as finding our human purpose and like why we're here on this world and what we can do to be kind of stewards of nature and part of nature um so i think for me this area of food and farming is just the most obvious and central point for that to happen because food is joyful and it's collaborative and it also can 
be so destructive but also really positive and can make such a difference and can open people's minds to new ways of working and being. Hi, I'm Leo, uh, Leo Hadouski. Um, I'm with Students Organising for Sustainability. Um, I've come from the University of Edinburgh. I study philosophy and politics um, with a focus on environmental philosophy and ethics and politics. And why do you care about food and farming? I'm desperately passionate about helping bring about the radical and fundamental change to our systems that I believe we need. As a neurodivergent, queer, Scot, socialised as a woman, surrounded by, you know, the abuse of men in positions of power, um, you know, watching uh, my mum, who had like three different jobs when I was growing up, like struggling and being on school meals, which were like turkey twizzlers and potato smileys and stuff. Um, I've seen a lot of like pain and struggle and um, but I go out into the woods and I'm just asking, like, what is all this, like, suffering and struggle for? Like, we have everything we need. It just seems like we're creating so many more problems when actually a lot of the, sim- the answers are so much more simple. Yeah. And so what brings you to this conference? What brings you here? Well, honestly, it was to figure out what to write for my dissertation. <laughs> um, but No, but actually to deepen my understanding of our land and seas and how we use them in the UK and how that differs um, in different parts of the Isles and how we can build a truly holistic and regenerative life system for the social, political, economic, spiritual well-being of the people that inhabit these islands and beyond in different ways because it's not just about food and farming really at this conference or in general but about owning up to our country's past and transforming our present for a future um, of freedom and abundance. Hi I'm Vizzle Walters, I'm from Warwickshire, I'm a farmer and agricultural planner and I'm here at the Oxford Real Farming Conference with NFYFC. Why do you care about food and farming? I've been brought up around food and farming on our family farm and it's just something I'm so passionate about. You need a farmer three times a day minimum to eat and it's not something that we can get away without having so we've got to ensure that we're farming sustainably and in line with nature and the environment but also most importantly, producing good quality food for not just our nation, but the world. Growing up on the farm, was it always your intentions to get into farming one day? Me personally, yes. I knew I always wanted to be involved in agriculture. My parents, however, due to family farming politics, pushed me away from it. And I was actually going to go and study music at university. But I rebelled and I went off to study agriculture and I've been involved in the industry ever since. Amazing. And what were your motivations behind being here at the, at the conference? I've been to quite a few conferences in the past and the opportunity to come to this one came up and I just thought actually this looks quite alternative, a bit different, quite new and fresh as well. So I thought I'd come along and there's been some phenomenal speakers, lots of different sessions going on um, with lots of new ideas actually and new techniques around farming, um, new people as well that I wouldn't normally mix with. So I just thought I'll come along um, and just see what it's all about. So my name's Aruj, Um, I'm from the north, I'm based in Bradford, so I've come down to Oxford for the ORFC this year for the first time. Um, So my day job, uh, I work as an operations person. Uh, I studied civil engineering at university and I was a structural engineer, moved into tech, um, and now I'm sort of interested in the crossover, so I'm really interested in sort of the built environment tech and construction tech. Um, And so it's really random that I'm at a farming conference. Um, But yeah, it's really... You say it's random that you're here, (laughs) but why are you passionate about food and farming? Why are you here? Um, The reason I'm interested in it is, it sort of, I think, started when I was looking more into food, where it comes from, like growing up in the inner city, you're not really exposed to where your food comes from. You just kind of like Mm -hmm. see it in the supermarket and then you'll sort of arrive at home. And um, there's a big disconnect as to where it comes from. But obviously growing up as a Muslim as well um, and, and... you know, a person of faith. It's really important to me from that sense as well. There's a big spiritual aspect to food. It's not <clears throat> not only in the way that food is procured, but also the way you eat it. There's so many rich traditions and narrations about um, agriculture being such a beloved profession to God because it's 
um, it's one of the purest forms. It can be one of the purest forms of worship, and it's it's you're very autonomous. Um, if you're a farmer, you you know you're not like tied to an employer. Like someone can like kind of hold your livelihood against you if you've got a, a job, for example. You know you can be fired if you um, hold a certain view or or something like that. So you're truly free because you're raising animals, you're feeding your family, um, and there's a really interesting aspect to it from that side. But also, um, it's an amazing means of of making money and supporting your family as well. Um, being um, kids of diaspora as well and when I visited other countries um, in the east and I've seen how connected people are with their food and you you know a lot of people will butcher in their own homes or, or like you know they'll be so connected to it and they really respect where their food comes from and it's such a shame that we don't embody this more and we're not like as Muslim as the Muslim community in the UK we're not more at the forefront of of sort of ethical farming because it goes hand in hand with our faith which I think a lot of people don't realize because yeah, we don't talk about it we don't embody it um, yeah. And so there's a, <clears throat> an interest from my side to just kind of raise the profile of that and kind of talk more about these things. So there's more of a discussion about it. So we will be hearing more from Leo, Phoebe, Aruj and Biza throughout this episode, hearing about what they've learned and found inspiration from during the conference. The schedule is packed and there are so many sessions to choose from. So I'm going to go see who I can bump into along the way and interview during the conference. As I mentioned earlier, I live on my family's beef and sheep farm in Devon. I've grown up around farming and it is a huge part of my life. My experience of farming is very much that farming is a community farming is a way of life but some would argue that one of the things that farmers have a pretty bad reputation for is their ability to communicate whether that's with each other or with the general public and that is why i now do things like this like podcasting social media videos because i think it's so important that farmers and the agricultural industry knows how to communicate if we're going to make our food systems more sustainable, if we're going to shorten food supply chains, then farmers and the industry need to know what the consumers want, and consumers need to have a better understanding of where their food comes from. And this is what I'm particularly passionate about. So looking at the schedule for the conference, one of the sessions that I'm really looking forward to attending is media storytelling for food systems change. This is all about the power of storytelling and includes a speaker called Anna Jones. Anna is a rural affairs journalist, she's a Nuffield scholar and an author and she set up a really cool project called Just Farmers which is all about connecting journalists with farmers and giving farmers the tools to be able to tell stories. I think it is brilliant and I've looked up to Anna for a while so I'm really looking forward to that session and I'm going to go see if I can get an interview with her. Okay so I'm now excited to be joined by Anna Jones, author and journalist and you've been involved in a session all about storytelling at the conference and obviously we're at a conference where we've had lots of sessions about farming practices and food systems why is it important that we also have a session about storytelling this is a conference full of very passionate very knowledgeable people about a subject not many people are passionate and knowledgeable about mm -hmm. so if we only share that knowledge and passion with ourselves, before long we become a very small group of people talking to each other. Yeah. So the reason storytelling is so important is getting that knowledge and passion beyond the spaces we are used to and the people that we know get it and getting it out to people who might not have heard of agroecology or might not have heard of regen farming or things that are now very familiar to us, to the general public are still new concepts. Yeah. So storytelling is making sure that we can break out of our own echo chambers and get beyond that. And storytelling is the key to that, in, in my view anyway. And when it comes to those stories about agroecology, whose responsibility is it to be telling those stories, do you think? Who should be telling those stories? That's a really good question. I mean, I know who is telling those stories and it often comes down to organizations, brands, interest groups, campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, it's harder to get the 
grassroots practitioners to be doing the talking, often because they're just simply not as good at the talking as people who might be leading the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and I think where I like to work is at that grassroots practitioner level, somebody who is practicing it day in, day out, in all weathers, yeah. literally getting their hands in the dirt every day. Um, if we can get the stories coming from that space, yeah. they are speaking from real, tangible, personal experience. It's a testimony from the ground. And once once those people develop those storytelling skills, they can become really, really good at it. And it's not just about talking. It can become about shooting video, making little films, whether it's on market gardens or allotments or small farms, wherever it might be. Then it can become how-to videos, how to do this, how to do that, little podcasts, yeah. reels and things like that on social media. And before you know it, you've got an extremely practical person, but also a, a strong communicator. Brilliant. And um, yeah, so that's that's the space specifically I like to work in. Brilliant. And speaking of that and speaking of the grassroots and training them up to have those skills, you set up Just Farmers and we're joined by Emily Davis, who works for Just Farmers. Emily, do you want to, do you want to just explain what Just Farmers is? Yeah, so um, Just Farmers is a community uh, interest company and we provide free media education to farmers and growers. Um, and at the same time, we also connect them with members of the media and journalists. So it's not media training. We educate farmers on how the media works, what they do and why they do it. Um, it's kind of about breaking down that barrier between them and the media, teaching them what's going on at the end of the phone, what's happening at the news desk, teaching them that the journalist has deadlines just as well as the farmer. You know, it's, it's all kinds of things. And um, and um, we do this because we believe that there's a divide um, between the general public and farmers and growers and what they do. And the best way to bridge that divide is by helping them to learn how to tell their story mm -hmm. and to get it out there and communicate it through print, radio, broadcast and social media. Incredible. And finally, if um, for the young people that are listening to this podcast, young farmers, if they have a story that they want to tell, and something they want to say that just really don't know how to go about doing it where do they start like what what is your top tip if where do they start in trying to tell that story firstly just to be yourself um don't try and act or tell anyone else's story or say any line that they feel they should be saying speak honestly and openly and from the heart uh, clear communication isn't easy, but think about if you're talking to someone who is seven years old, explaining your story to them and how they would understand it. Um, I think they would probably be my two best tips for starting. Amazing. Thank you so much, both of you, for giving up your time to have a chat. Thank you. So myself, Biza and Anya from Flame are just about to attend another session. This one is called What Role for Grazing Livestock in a Warming World? Seeing as both Biza and I both work with livestock on our farms, we both really wanted to attend this one. And um, on the panel, they have a farmer called Carl Williams, as well as another farmer called Sophie Gregory, who's actually also from the Southwest. She's from my neck of the woods. Um, after the session, Bizza is going to try and have a chat with Carl and I'm going to try and speak to Sophie and we'll try and bring it to you on the podcast. So let's see how it goes. The session is about to start. If we're ever going to win this, um, this argument, it's to get young people involved and it's then once they're informed, they won't be easily switched from an ideological incorrect narrative going to a bilateral broadcast. Um, so my question was going to be, you mentioned that when you first started looking into this, your old school agricultural mind really struggled to adapt to all the changes. Yeah. So as a young person in that kind of situation where the generation above me is of that very much old school, we're not changing anything, sticking to our traditional methods, what advice, if any, would you give to someone like me who wants to start introducing this onto the farm? Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely what we've seen on farm, um, you know, because I would say things are changing you know we'd have groups of farmers out you know four or five years ago and I would say 90% of them would say you lot are crazy you know I think the big thing with regenerative agriculture it does look a little bit more messy you know you're not going to go into you know six inches of rye grass and nice red clover 
you know, you've got a very diverse ward. That, I think, for a lot of people is like, yeah, and we've had a lot of young farmers that come on farm and go, yeah, we get it. Yeah. Love to do this, but dad Absolutely would not, not like this. No way. Yeah. <laughs> so again, but I think, yeah, having those conversations, and again, I think what we're seeing now, whereas I said, you know, 90% used to think we were crazy, it's flipped now. Right. So 90% are saying, actually, what are you doing? So we're a little bit more interested in, in you know, and again, you know, once you've got the figures to back it up, you know, no purchase feed, no fertilizers, no chemical inputs, finishing at 24 months of age. Yeah, that then starts, you know, triggering things in people's mind. Actually, this this does work. But as I said at the end, you know, get out, you know, see other farms, talk to other farmers because it's really important, you know, because you can sit and read the farmers weekly in the, in the safety of your own kitchen and go, I'm not going to do this, but yeah, Take we that along with you. yeah we need to, we need to challenge each other. We need to do things better. I think you know we have the opportunity. I think we've got there. There is potentially another agricultural revolution coming in terms of how we can decouple ourselves from you know pretty extreme you know input costs. It's it's not easy, you know, because yeah, as I know, dad, granddad, um, you know, are going to push back against it. Um, but again, what I say get them out on farm you know get them having conversations um and i think it's yeah the younger generation are really interested in it because they they see the opportunity of it wow thank you so much okay so we are now joined by sophie gregory who is a dairy farmer on the dorset devon border um sophie we've just been talking about grazing in a warming world um you farm in an organic way you've always been an organic farmer but you also farm in a regenerative way why is that so i suppose it, it all started really when we were sort of losing growth on our grass and also our soil and seeds were reducing so we just looked at our system and decided we need to do something differently so we yeah we're just including more diversity in our grass lays herbal lays um we're treating our hedgerows differently um we're reducing tillage so less plowing and um we also are trying to get more people on farm because we think it's really important that people know where their food's from. For sure. And what kind of impact and benefits, environmental benefits, have you seen from, from those practices? So we've seen, yeah, increased um, soil organic matter, which is really important maybe in the future if we end up selling carbon or actually just to keep the water in the soil rather than um, flooding. We've seen extreme weathers now, and so we're, infiltration rates have been massively improved. Um, we're seeing benefits. The social benefits is actually our team has been made up of a lot of people who've come to the farm, seen what we're doing, and been actually got involved and got a job with us through that. So that's a huge huge environmental impact and then also the um, wildlife um, we've just seen new, lots of birds return that haven't been there for ages yeah. so that's yeah really rewarding okay so i've just bumped into a rouge and earlier today you went on a little field trip to a farm a little excursion tell me about it where did you go yeah so i was at willowbrook farm so this is um an organization that i've been following for quite a while because as i was learning more about sustainability you know organic farming and things like that grass-fed uh free range this is a farm that i sort of came across in the news and and i've been following them for a while because they're sort of really exemplifying what i feel halal and daya which means lawful and pure should be um and you know how, how they practice so their chickens are all free range you know their animals are well looked after they're seeing the light of day every single day they're out and about having fun you know i almost um got chased by a ram today so <laughs> it's like you know the proof is is there <laughs> the full um, farm experience today <laughs> yeah so and i thought you know, it was very spontaneous it's at their farming conference. And I realized where I was staying, it was only 15 minutes away. And I thought I have to message them and say, I'm around, can I come by? And they were really gracious to let me come by. And I went over this morning and just kind of like dug in. I was like, you know, a bit of a farm hand for a day, you know, like um, role playing as a farmer. So I wasn't, <laughs> I, I think I was a bit more of a burden than I was useful, but you know. <laughs> So the lady I was working with today, her name is Lamia. She was running through the philosophy behind the farm, why they do what they do and detailing what her day looks like. I imagine a lot of farmers can relate actually. Every day is absolutely packed. There's a new challenge at every turn. On top of that, you're balancing family and social life. So much work goes into producing our food and we as consumers on the other side, we don't really think about it. I think in an ideal world, farmers would be close by. That's a whole other conversation about urban urban centres. Um, I mean, we just have more of them. We know them on a first name basis, and seeing the process cradle to grave, so to speak, would be normal. Uh, we'd be eating more nose to tail, minimal to no waste, um, and any parts that we can't eat, we can repurpose sustainably. 
because just speaking to the family today and just kind of seeing the farm, seeing the process, it was really eye-opening. I mean, I was aware of a lot of these things before, but to really kind of be part of it and, and really hands-on, it gave me a much deeper appreciation. And it works two ways, doesn't it? Because it really benefits you learning about this and you get so much more appreciation for your food, etc. learning about it. But the farmer gets loads out of that as well in building that relationship. It's not just a benefit of the consumer. And I think through experiencing this, you really understand the economics of meat. It shouldn't be as cheap as it is, but it's a really difficult difficult conversation to have when people are struggling to make ends meet as well. I mean, I grew up in the inner city. I was on free school meals. Um, so I appreciate both sides of these com of this conversation, but this is something we need to reevaluate. Perhaps it's the middlemen we should be looking at and how we can more fairly distribute profits. But I don't have those answers. Can we take a bit of a step back and can you just explain when food is halal, mm -hmm. what does that mean? So halal is not just in the way you slaughter an animal, the term actually comes as a set with another word, thayyib, which means pure. So it relates to how you raise an animal. So there's different conditions that you have to satisfy to ensure meat is halal. Uh, essentially, you're saying the name of God, you cut the neck in a way to sever, to sever certain veins, arteries and the windpipe and let the blood out. So it's very similar to the legal slaughter here in the UK in terms of the process, which is also what I learned at the farm. Um, and there's this big misconception, you know, that halal is something really odd or mystical. And if you eat it, you, you know, if you eat halal meat, you'll suddenly feel the urge to become Muslim. <laughs> so, yeah, there's um, there's obviously a lot of deep and rich religious background to these rulings. We can't speak to the full depth and wisdom of God, but you can see the effects, you know, by having to be present, saying the name of God. It makes you think of creation, the gravity of the situation you're in, you know, where your place is in this in this ecosystem it makes you think about life and death. Um, you know, there's another element to this as well, you know, in the sense of which animals you can or cannot eat. So popularly known is that, you know, Muslims don't eat pig um, or pork. So, of course, you know, that's not permissible. But alongside that, there's other classifications such as predators with claws that aren't permissible either. And I think that's so cool that you were able to visit that yeah. farm this morning. <laughs> yeah, and it was amazing. And so, like, at the Oxford Real Farming Conference, I was really putting the real farming into, into <laughs> <laughs> our Absolutely. <laughs> I am now joined by Sam from the Nature Friendly Farming Network. I've seen lots of the team around the conference. Sam, do you want to just explain what the Nature Friendly Farming Network is? Yeah, cool. So we're a network of, um, well, we're a farmer-led organisation. We're a network of four groups across the four countries in the UK, made up of uh, 10 farmers on each steering group. Um, and then we've also got a sustainable lead as well heading us up. So um, we lobby um, government and politicians um, across all four countries. And then we're also uh, engaging with farmers with knowledge transfer, um, running training days. We've done quite a bit in Wales. So sorry, I'm based in the Wales, Team Wales um, in North Wales. And we've been running quite a few weatherproof farming um, training events. So yeah, it's been great to sort of link up with more farmers and know that we're not the only ones out there sort of you're not on your own um wanting to put back into the system and work with nature and build some natural resilience into our farming systems and businesses yeah. so why should a farmer be working with nature oh do you know it's really good for, uh, i can only talk from um my sort of experience but it's really good for my mental health just not to have that extractive mindset so much now so i'm originally from sussex from um a thousand acre council farm mostly arable you know it was big machinery um and it and it just seemed to be that yeah we were taking and maybe not putting enough back in and I didn't know I didn't know that at the time and then I've um, married someone from North Wales moved up there it's just a small farm but it's amazing the difference you can make without having to spend much money which is always a benefit yeah it's just real feel good knowing that we could be the age that could turn that sort of biodiversity decline around and, you know looking back in the history books if we were the age that did that would be amazing so we have packed in so, so much into just a couple days here at the conference. Countless speakers and sessions. I had to catch up with Leo, Biza, Phoebe and Aruj to find out what they found particularly inspiring during the conference and whether anything has changed their perceptions. So we went to a session earlier today um, and it was what is the role of grazing livestock in a warming world and there was a speaker there called Carl Williams who is um, a beef and I is it just beef farm, I think? I don't think he had any arable. Um, and he was saying how he was uh, a very you know, old school, old technique farmer, didn't want to change anything. He went on this regen course for three days and 
had a bit of a panic that this isn't the way forward, this isn't going to work, but actually by the end of it, I really had opened his mind up. And I think that's quite inspiring because I'm in a situation where I've got family members that don't want to listen to any change, they don't want to know, you know how we can use different techniques in, within the business um, and practices and I just thought well there's a prime example that he has changed the way he's farmed he's completely regenerative and organic now and he's got the physical figures to show that he I think he's reduced his cattle fattening time by about six months so there's actual proof there that it's working for him and so that for me was really inspiring because it just goes to show that there are people out there that want to change their mindset and if you've got the actual evidence and you know figures for proof maybe we can take that forward into my sort of situation and I can say look guys this has happened I'm sure we could go and visit him or we could go and visit someone locally that's done the same thing and let's just start planting those seeds to see how we can introduce these different techniques into our farming practices at home. Leo so I'm looking down at your notebook and there are so many notes I love it um what has it been about this past couple of days is there anything in particular that you found really inspiring which may may feed into your dissertation maybe? Oh absolutely I I feel just Oh, so grateful. The first lecture that I went to, um, it was just, I mean, it answered it all. It was called From Corporations to Communities, Tipping the Balance of Power in the Decision Making about our food. It was incredibly inspiring um, talk. Um, and they were just talking um, a lot about the corporate influence um, on our food systems and like how that really needs to change if we're to really evolve as a um, country to have a more like regenerative food um, culture, like lives. I mean, food's just part of everything. Um, I was in a bit of a hands-on workshop yesterday um, with uh, Babs from Botanical Inks and she was going through um, taking like, you know, common plants or uh, even weeds that we consider uh, maybe or certain herbs like mugwort and using them to create natural dyes and how we can use that for textiles instead. So like using things that are biodegradable. Ooh. So yeah, and it was nice to hear more about her philosophy and, and how she's trying to be, get sort of a purest process as possible yeah. um, in that sense and try and be completely like zero waste or completely <clears throat> biodegradable, which is, yeah, um, really fascinating. Um, I have been in a really good session this morning with Anna Jones, um, who wrote the book Divided and runs Just Farmers. Um, we talked about creating a really good story and making things that matter to us interesting to other people, which often I find really tricky. I think it's shown me that I can, like I could create a podcast or I could write more blogs and I do have something to say and where I might have thought like, oh I don't have anything that's of interest, I actually can rethink that now as I have things to say, I just need to make them interesting. We are the weavers. The cedars, the petrochemical mourners. We've watched the world sub itself into four monoculture corners. We are fighting for our future with a diversity of greens. We are a radical rainbow of brassicas and beans sprouting from the seed. Oh, yes, that was a woo moment there. <laughs> we are community. We are tribe. Custodians of the stories which will help our people stay alive. And every time they squash us, we Grow squash. <laughs> <laughs> if we leave this conference more positive, more energised and refreshed for the year ahead, if you've learned something new, or you've been given an idea that you're going to go back home and try for yourself, if you've met someone new, or you've had a good catch-up with an old friend that you haven't seen for the whole of the last year, if any of these hit things happen to you, then we will have done our job. So stay safe, keep well, and we'll see you all again next year. Thank you. So the closing ceremony has just finished so many inspiring speakers and what a couple of days it has been. I need to recover from the sheer quantity of discussion, the positivity, the excitement, the diversity of people here. I have never been to an event quite like it and that is going to be one of my main takeaways from this conference that there are so many people looking for alternative ways to farm, to, to look at the food system as a whole and this event was definitely a culmination of that and clearly it's a movement that is growing and has lots of momentum behind it. 
it has been amazing to see a lot of young people at this event and I think that it is vital that young people are included in these conversations about the future of our food systems. I personally believe that organisations, especially youth organisations like the National Federation of Young Farmers Clubs, plays a really important role in empowering young people to get involved in conversations about decision making, about the future of our industry and I'd like to see more opportunities for young people to get a seat around that table, to listen to other people's views and continue to learn. This brings me to the end of this podcast episode. Thank you for listening and hopefully it's given you a flavour of this event and opened your eyes and your ears to some different perspectives. I'm going to be leaving you with a few final words from the How Farming Can Call the Planet team, as well as from Biza, Leo, Phoebe and Aruj about what future opportunities they would like to see for young people interested in food and farming. This conference has been just absolutely incredible. I'm just way, like I'm too inspired. I'm going to have to take a rest after this. I think training, um, accredited training is really important. Um, I also think networking opportunities, opportunities to visit other farms and meet people who are already in the industry. But I think coming to places like ORFC enables that because everyone is here. So Tilly from SOS UK, what are your takeaway thoughts from the conference? I just felt incredibly inspired and privileged to be part of a project, um, How Farming Can Call the Planet, that's been able to bring together students, young farmers and youth food activists in the same space. Everyone's had such different experiences and values and stories to tell, um, but have been so willing to share those stories and their hopes and fears. And it's just been really good to be able to see the conference through their eyes rather than not just I've been for many years and I just saw it through my eyes before and listening to some of the conversations has just been brilliant I've loved it yeah a diverse regenerative agroecological movement yeah I want to help sort this country out I'm going to go back to my local community having made loads of pals here to help continue to build a diverse solidarity network to tackle these challenges. Anya from Flame, what are your final thoughts? Sometimes within food and farming, I feel like the discussions get very polarised between different viewpoints and that there can be a lot of anger and culture wars that are expressed. But what has been really amazing for me is watching young people who have very different Um, backgrounds and thoughts on food and farming you know some might be young farmers working the land or land workers of different types or new entrants or food campaigners or climate activists or students studying agriculture a whole range of different views on food and farming and I've been really humbled by how these people who might not always agree have been able to come together and discuss these really difficult topics around the future of food production in our country and have been able to do it in a really respectful and open way and I think that that is a lesson for us all really. I'd really like to see young people being more involved at a decision making level within food and farming for example with policy um, events like this I think it's really important that the younger generations are here to have a voice and, and hear what's going on and have their say because at the end of the day we're the future generations and we are the ones going to be taking over um, food and farming and producing food for the nation and the rest of the world so it's really important that we're in the know we know what's going on we know what policies are coming in what's going out um, speaking with ministers and those that have key powers in decision making maybe people think about food and farming and think they have to be sort of on the ground like you know mucking out stalls or you know like looking after sheep but there's so many other things as well that are important so obviously you know like marketing like you're raising the profile of, of all these initiatives that are happening it's such a key role um, to get it out to masses so there's different things I work in operations so I'm sure that would lend itself quite well so just organizations that are in this space that need maybe operations people project managers and things like that so there's alternative career paths too you know this is a really interesting book that I read and it talked about innovation sometimes it's just taking two fields that are existing and bringing them 
together so like with you you've put farming and marketing together to create this new thing that you're really passionate about and that's really like moving the needle in this space and so sometimes it's just about being creative or you know whatever path you've been on it doesn't mean you're stuck on that path you can kind of move around and you know careers are very fluid these days so oh, i'm excited yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you too sarah palmer from nfyfc what are some of your takeaways from this year's conference dan i could spend hours talking about what I've taken away from the conference but I've met lots of people that I already work with lots of new people exchanged ideas but the two points that I wanted to share with you and everybody else I heard yesterday during a presentation so many doing such brilliant work but so little time something to really think about and then today which I think we'll all love we must hold on to our farmers they're our gods that's going to make the trailer. 